about then this notion of radical resilience. Let me define it for you. First off, this is what it is not. How many of you remember that character? Okay. You gotta be able to take a lickin' and keep on ticking. Well, there was that resiliency, Bozo the Clown. The traditional definition of resiliency is to do what? It is to bounce back. It is to bounce back, and that's exactly what happened with that image, Bozo the Clown. And the, those of us who remember it, you remember you would hit that thing and it would come back, hit it, and you'd come back. Who wants to be hit and come back in the same position to be hit again? I do not think this is very smart. So to me, the definition of resiliency is not about bouncing back. It's this. It is to grow through. What will it take to be resilient if I'm going to be able to grow through? And I'll tell you what I think it's going to take. Energy. At the end of the day, do you have the mental, emotional, physical hardiness that will create the energy that will allow you to grow through both adversity and challenge? Let's talk about what are the traits of what I think is a radically resilient leader. And I'm taking it from a leadership perspective, which is the background that I come from. There, there are four of them. Here's the first one. The first one is adaptability. Now, Rick used this term with you, requisite variety. We all say, yes, Eileen, to be resilient, I have to be adaptable. Requisite variety moves it to a far greater level. What requisite variety says, if you listen to what Rick said, it means that the organism with the greatest number of responses to any situation is the one that survives. So in other words, if you and I were playing chess, and I only knew two chess moves, and you knew 22 chess moves, who's going to win the chess game? You or me? You're going to win it, aren't you? So my notion of adaptability is how many ways can I find to respond to a given situation? Here's the second skill. The second skill is agility. It's speed coupled with wisdom. Two very important parts. How fast can I get that the world is changing around me? How quickly can I make those reports and how can I do it with wisdom? The third part, which I think is a critical resiliency skill, is laughability. The ability to keep a sense of humor, because that's going to tell you what's really important and what is not. And the last one is alignment. Alignment says, am I lined up with what is my perceived mission and values and goals? We suffer from something called SAD, Situational Attention Deficit Disorder. Now, I hope you notice, by the way, the, the pronoun that I'm using is we. I do not come to you as a voice of wisdom today. I come to you as a fellow pilgrim on this journey that we call life. And sometimes I think I understand this well. And other times, quite frankly, I stink. And my husband says, Eileen, read your book. <laughs> so... So I'm as I'm talking out loud to you, I'm talking out loud to myself. And so when I think of this suffering, this ailment called SAD, I'm going to describe some of the symptoms. And so that I don't feel like I'm alone, if you experience these symptoms, would you please say, oh, yeah. Can you do it? Oh, yeah. All right. So, all right. So here are some of the symptoms. You walk into a room. You stand there. And you think... I came in here for a reason. <laughs> Good. Got, all right, here, here's another one. You look down at your, your PDA, your day timer, you know, wherever it is that you keep appointments, and it says, John Jones, 10 o'clock. And you're thinking, I have no clue who he is. All right, now here, here's one of my favorite ones. In your, in your wonderful, proficient, productive best, you, uh, you make a phone call. And while the phone is ringing, you decide you're also going to answer email. You're ahead of me. <laughs> you're right. So that by the time the person on the phone says, hello, you forgot who you called. <laughs> right? Your brain went out your nose. That's a pretty sight, isn't it? <laughs> but you know what? The, 
This, this is multitasking at its absolute worst, and we do it all the time. The first research that was done on this actually came from the University of London, and they're continuing to track this and track this, that when we try to multitask that way, particularly because you're asking your brain to do a bunch of different things, you've got a visual component that's going here, you have the words that you're going to type here, then you also have the auditory side here, you lose as much temporarily as 10 points of IQ trying to do that. That is as much as if you had sat there and smoked a joint. <laughs> so the next time you feel tempted to do this, just pretend, go, I'm not going to do this. Now, Eileen, I, I read up a little bit about you. You're a, uh, a public speaker. You're a business consultant. I'm curious, at what point, when were you walking in the woods when kind of the light bulb clicked? And you said, hey, wait a second, it's all the same thing. Hiking, working, life, it's all the same thing. Well, it actually clicked about seven years ago when I was on a very difficult uh, trek with my husband. And I either had to find meaning there or I was going to kill him. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, that was the way it was. But, you know, I just started to make some notes. And as I was making notes, I said, you know what, this... There, there is meaning here. Like, like pack out your garbage. Your prior guest talked about green. Well, you know what? We have garbage that we hang on to in relationships, in business. You know what? That's not only in the physical world. It's also in the emotional world. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I thought that there would be lessons that I could see the similarities. And you know what? It all goes together. This is one life that we've got. We need to blend it together beautifully. This man had written the USDA wanting to know how to get dandelions out of the, ground, out of the lawn. And they wrote him back. And there was this whole series of correspondence because nothing worked, nothing worked, nothing worked. And finally, on the guy's last letter, he says, I've tried everything. I can't get rid of the dandelions. Some very probably low-level but brilliant clerk wrote on the letter, then we suggest you love them. <laughs> how many of you remember the Apollo 13? All right. Would you not say that was a series of risk after risk after risk that, and failures and failures and failures? Do you remember that? I had the wonderful opportunity of literally being Jim Lovell's seatmate, flying back from a conference in Hawaii. And so I, I got to ask him a number of questions. And he said, everything that you saw on that, what, in Tom Hanks' movie, was absolutely true. One of the things he said is, if you remember that story, Everything they tried, it failed, it failed, it failed. And the engineers come to Gene Krantz, who is head of mission control, and said to him, this is, this is horrible, this is horrible. We are never going to be able to get these men home. And Krantz looked at them and said, and it could be our finest hour. That's a pretty powerful reframing a pretty powerful reframing. And we want that of our leaders now. Don't tell me what is all wrong. Tell me what is the opportunity that is there. Let's talk about passion for a minute. You've heard this word used a number of times while we're here today. And when we think about passion, what organ of the body do you think of? The heart. Here's the heart. This heart is an amazing pump. There are 60,000 miles of veins, capillaries, and arteries in our heart. 60,000 miles. That is 20 round trips across the United States. And one of the things that we're seeing in the research that we're knowing about the heart is that the heart has an extraordinary energy field. Do you know it is 5,000 times the energy field of the brain? Ten feet away, I can measure the energy of a heart. And when we think about being remarkable, when we think about getting people who will help us as mentors, people in a network, you know what they respond to? Heart energy. Have you ever gone into a room and the energy is negative? You can feel it? You go, whoa, something's happening here. <laughs> Don't know what, but I'm backing out. <laughs> Didn't come from the brain. It came from the heart. It came from the heart. And the reason I think the heart is so important is we think with the heart. It is our intuition. 
and intuition is becoming more and more valuable in the marketplace. First and foremost, you are a practice community family. How many of you are here for the first time? Wow, would you look at that. Practice community. Do you not know when you bring new people into the fold, they sit there and say, God, they speak a language I'm not sure I understand? Because practice communities have their own language. You know, upline, downline. You know, you have all of these. When in network marketing, you've got a whole different language that you learn. And of course, as an Arbonne family, you have a whole different line of products. I mean, it is probably only few of the chosen who actually know that RE9 is not part of the tax code. That's only because you haven't gotten to them yet. <laughs> and you have your rights of passage. I mean, you have your rights of passage with that wonderful white Mercedes, which frankly is a far classier color than pink. <laughs>